welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. Okay, so now set up this entire sort of theory of programming, where we're going, because I want you to understand why we make the changes we're going to make. So now we're going to actually get into what those changes will start looking like once you have this theory. By the way, the theory is the most important thing. Let me be clear. Like, you can only take what I tell you to do in the hows for so long, right? And just as a side note, we get really good in America at the hows and really that's the whys, mm -hmm. right? We're just a country of hows. Everybody just wants to know, like, tell me the thing, right? But you're never going to be able to do this. This sort of teach a man to fish thing doesn't work until you know the whys. So you'll never be able to actually program for a myriad of people, including yourself, well, until you understand the whys behind it. So let's move on to overload. I'll hit this really quick. So overload is just the amount of stress necessary to drive the adaptations needed if it's not strength that we're looking for. But this is a class on strength and force production. Remember that graph that I showed you in the very beginning, that, you know, with the waves? How much above the baseline is needed to drive the stress adaptation? If too much, I can't recover from it. I'll overtrain, or at worst case scenario, it will kill me. I'll actually die, right? If not enough stress, it's not enough to drive the adaptation. There is a small window of overload that I must be able to hit that produce that stress that will produce the adaptation that I'm looking for, force production. Now, here's the thing. For a novice, where you guys have all been and where some of you still are, but where everybody starts, the stress recovery adaptation cycle and overload is super clean and easy to understand. The stress is the Monday workout. It is. The recovery is the time between the Monday workout and the Wednesday workout. It's essentially Tuesday, right? And the adaptation we know occurred because we were able to go up in weight from Monday to Wednesday, and not just from Monday to Wednesday, because one day is not enough to give us good data, but also from Wednesday to Friday and Friday to Monday and Monday to Wednesday, and for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, we're able to keep going up. So you know adaptation occurred. So the amount of overload was right. Now, we've fleshed this out for decades. We know essentially what we do is we go up five pounds every workout. Now, that depends some on gender and age and stuff, right? So in the beginning, some of you guys and maybe even some of you girls can go up 10 pounds or even 15 pounds on things like the deadlift for a workout or two. And then you drive to five pounds, you run five pounds out for as long as you can. And then you usually start microloading and you go to smaller jumps. Instead of making five pound jumps, you go to like two and a half pound jumps, which will require you to have one and a quarter pound plates. Almost no gyms have. Does the university gym have one and a quarter pound plates? Do you bring one and a quarter pound plates? Yep. Yeah, right? So everybody should own some, some fractional place that you just keep in your gym bag so that as you get older and get out of college and go start training at a gym somewhere, you just keep those fractional plates in your bag because you're not going to walk into a gym that has one and a quarter pound plates or one pound plates or half pound plates or whatever. If I'm training a lady who's 60, she can't add two and a half pounds every single workout to her press. That's too much. She can't put one and a quarters on. I got to make like one pound jumps. And that's fine. Nothing wrong with that, right? So oh, that's what overload is. Okay, next. Now, here's the question. Why does LP end? Why does linear progression end? Why can you not put weight on the bar? Why do you stop making progress? Yes? Do we get closer to our genetic potential? So no. I mean, it's a good guess, but here's the question. Where, let's just guess an average. Well, for most of you guys, where did most of you guys end, those of you who have ended LP, the males, the start of the males, where did you stop your squat at LP? Where did you kind of run out of LP if you've run out? And if not, where are you right now? Three sets of five. Where are you doing your three sets of five right now? 260. And is it getting real hard and it's hard to put weight on every single time? Yeah. Okay, you? Okay. Okay. I don't even need to go on. Okay, right? There's, we've got to start having an average. And I realize some of you are lighter weight guys are going to be a little lighter, heavier weight guys are going to be a little heavier. But in general, there's the thing. Now, what do you think? Let's just start with you first three guys. Your genetic potential is to squat. Like perfect programming for the next 10 years, right? You really will hit your absolute strength maximum probably somewhere in your late 30s. Right? So you guys are in your early 20s, right? So you got 15, 16, 18 years left. Before, so if you train perfectly for the next 15 to 20 years, 
How much do you think you potentially could squat one day? I'm not even gonna say yes. I'd say 600, 500, between 500 and 600, right? So here's the question, how close is that to your genetic potential? Probably. Like it's less than half, right? And you might not ever get there, but we're still a ways away. So it's not, it's not a bad guess. It's just, you still got a long ways to go. Why does it end? Okay, here's the deal. The day is coming for you. 260, as I always said, 265, wherever you're, okay? When you're not gonna be able to go, let's say, let's say you go from 260, are you making five pound jumps or two and a half right now? So five. Oh, yeah. So you're gonna go in, you're gonna do 265, and then 265, you're gonna go to 270, and then 270, you go to 275. The day's coming soon when you can't go from, let's say, 275 to 280. You can't squat 275 for three sets of five on Monday, and then 280 on Wednesday. You're gonna miss. Why? Why did you miss? So one theory is there's too much fatigue left over from Monday to actually recover by Wednesday. And that's the most standard way of thinking. And I actually don't disagree with that at all. I think that's exactly right. But I actually think there's something else. For most of us, we get to the point where what is the driver of overload in novice linear progression? Is it volume or intensity? What's the constant? Let's start there. What's the same every single workout? Sets and reps. And what is sets and reps? Volume or intensity? That's volume. Volume, sets and reps. That doesn't change. Frequency, which again, we talked about as a product of volume, that doesn't change. What changes? Only one thing changes. Intensity, which is what? The weight on the bar changes. That's the only thing we do to drive up stress, whether you're a male, whether you're a female, whether you're 13, whether you're 82. In the beginning, the only thing that changes is the weight goes up until it doesn't, because it can't, which means why can't it go up? Well, here's my theory. One, remember we go back to that original map. We're not able to make a big enough jump in weight to increase the stress enough to drive the adaptation. That's number one. When you're squatting 300 pounds for three sets of five, and you can't add five pounds anymore, you're only adding two and a half, how much more stress is 300 pounds for three sets of five versus 302.5 for three sets of five? Well, it's not that much more stress, just two and a half more pounds. And that might be enough stress to drive adaptation, but at some point it won't be. You're not able to increase the stress enough to drive the adaptation, but also, you're not able to recover fast enough. Because if it is just recovery, this is what's so important. If you get to the point where you can't go from 275 for three sets of five on Monday, you hit that, to 280 on Wednesday, and it's just a recovery issue because you can't recover, couldn't you just take another couple days and recover and then come in and hit 280? And instead of squatting every other day, couldn't you just squat every third day or every fourth day? And then every fifth day? and then every seventh day, and then every 10th day. Now, wait a minute. If I'm only squatting every 10th day because it's a recovery issue and a recovery issue only, something else is going to occur when there's 10 days between my squat workouts. And that's what we call detraining. You're actually going to detrain. You're actually going to get worse by the time you recover. See, there's two things going on when we train. There's the stress which we, in the literature, is called fitness. It's called the fitness. How fit are you? Because they're not just meaning specifically for strength training. They're anything, right? And there's fatigue. There's fitness and fatigue. And they're all playing together at the same time. And at the end of LP, you obviously have accumulated fatigue, but you're not able to add more stress because it's too damn heavy at that point. You can't add more stress. So I'm not even able to add enough stress to drive the adaptation, but I'm also not able to recover from the thing that I did to get better. So that's when LP stops. So and that's coming for you if it hasn't hit yet. Then what do we do? I believe we do what I call minimum effective dose for short. It's actually minimum effective dose of complexity for maximum return on investment. This is key. I still want to make the smallest change I can to continue to drive the adaptation. Again, this is super easy to understand in LP. 
if the smallest change I can make is taking my squat from 275 for three sets of five, and on Wednesday I can go to 277 and a half for three sets of five, do it if it works. And when it stops working, what are you going to do? Well, at that point, I have to start bringing in another variable. Up until this point, all I've done is increase intensity. Now what do I have to do? I gotta start increasing volume. I have to start doing more work. And I have to start giving myself enough recovery. So I have to start balancing that fitness and fatigue. The stress, how much stress will drive the adaptation and the fatigue. I have to learn a theory of the right relationship between intensity and volume. If intensity can't go up anymore, what am I gotta do? Well, I've already told you, there's only two ways to drive stress, intensity and volume. Intensity can't go up anymore. How do I keep making sure I'm getting more stress? I'll start adding volume. So now instead of doing three sets of five, what might I do? Four sets of five. Is that more volume? Yep. Is that more stress than three sets of five? Yep. And then I could go five sets of five. And I go six sets of five and seven sets of five and eight sets of five and 10 sets of five. Hold on. See, the same thing will eventually occur with volume as well. 10 sets of five is not going to make you stronger. It's just too much volume. I can keep increasing intensity and make the weight on the bar keep going up, and I can bring the volume down a little bit in order to balance the volume and intensity relationship. Or I can keep driving the volume up, and I can bring the intensity down just a little bit so that I keep the right relationship. But if I take that to the end of the spectrum, the end of the spectrum on the intensity side would be, I just go in the gym, I hit a one rep max, just like you guys did yesterday, and I get out. And two days later, three days later, four days later, I go in and hit one rep max again. That's the highest possible intensity I could hit, the most weight on the bar. And that's no volume, right? It's one rep. How strong will I get doing that? Not very strong for very long. Like, you might actually get better for a few workouts. And then what are you going to do? Well, I can do the same thing with volume. How many of you guys have heard of German volume training? You ever heard of that? Before, it's in like the muscle magazines and stuff. It's like a famous way to train from the 70s and 80s. It's 10 sets of 10. That's really what it is. It's crazy. 10 sets of 10. How much volume is that? How many work reps is three sets of five? 15. How many work reps is 10 sets of 10? 100. How heavy can you go 10 sets of 10? Let's find out. Not very heavy. So much so that you can't get any stronger. So I can do tons of volume and very little intensity, and it doesn't make me stronger. And I can do tons of intensity and not very much volume, and it doesn't make me stronger. The key is to do the right amount of both. And in the beginning, that's three sets of five. I just keep adding weight until I can't do it anymore. And so then we must have a paradigm shift. We must have a paradigm shift. Here's what the world does with programs. Okay, I did the starting strength novice linear progression program. Eventually it stopped working. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna do a new program. What's the new program I'm gonna do? Well, there's, I don't know, do you guys know what Texas method is? Have you heard of that yet? Okay, but there's an intermediate program. When you can't add weight to the bar anymore on novice linear progression, you're no longer a novice. It's not about how strong you are. You got me? It's that you can't add weight anymore to the bar. Now, there are some people who will end their novice linear progression way too early because they won't get enough rest, they'll drink too much alcohol, they'll have too much stress in their life outside of training, and they prematurely end their novice LP. But everybody at some point can't add weight to the bar. And when you can't add weight to the bar every single workout, you're not a novice anymore. You're something else. And when you can't add weight anymore, you have to do something else. Well, what the world has done up until what we're discussing right now, this is actually really kind of cutting edge stuff. Not that we're inventing something, it's just a new way of looking at it. They would say, well, that stopped working, so let's just do the new program. Let's do Texas Method or Heavy Light Medium or 531 or whatever program I pull out of Muscle and Fitness Magazine or whatever. Wrong. It's the wrong way to look at it. The way to look at it is, how do I make a minimum effective dose change to the thing I've been doing that has just stopped working to keep making progress. And what you might do is you might add a set to Monday's squat workout. Instead of doing three sets of five, you might do four sets of five. But you know what else you might do? 
At the same time, you might take a set away from Friday and go from three sets of five on Friday to two sets of five on Friday and make the weight go up so that the intensity is higher on Friday and the volume is higher on Monday. Ooh, the chill. I just saw you guys all got chills on your neck when I said it. Right? <laughs> That's so simple, right? And then might I do the same thing when that stops working again? They go to five sets of five on Monday and go to one set of five on Friday and make the intensity keep going up. And when you get to five sets of five on Monday on squats and one set of five on Friday, and we usually do a lighter day on Wednesday, three sets of five with like reduced so it's not too much stress. Now you're doing a program that we call the Texas method. You can write that down. Look it up. It's super easy to find the Texas method. Just Google it. Texas method. So instead of getting to the end of linear progression and going, oh, crap, I can't do this anymore. I'll just go to the Texas method. Well, going from three sets of five on Monday to five sets of five on Monday overnight is a lot more stress. It's hard to recover from. Not saying you can't. You're college kids. If anybody can, maybe you guys can. It just makes more sense and gives me better data, and I'm sitting in a STEM building, right? That's what this building is, so data actually matters, that why wouldn't I just make the smallest change possible? Here's the deal. Why would I want to do 10 sets of five if four sets of five gets me the return I want? Do less work for more ROI until it stops working, and then do a little more work, a little more stress, right? Makes sense? Now, in order to know that it works... How do I know it works? So up to this point, we're still talking theory. It's going to stop working, so now I'm going to make a minimum effective dose change of complexity to make sure it works. How do I know it works? Well, I have two types of metrics I can use. I have quantitative metrics, and I have qualitative metrics. Quantitative gives me hard numbers. It doesn't matter what it feels like. You know the best hard number? The PR. Now, don't get this confused. When I say the PR, I don't just mean a one rep max like you did yesterday. You guys should all have a three sets of five PR, right? I've never done this much. Well, I've never done 270 pounds for three sets of five. That'd be a PR for me. Okay, we made progress. Especially if the next time you do three sets of five, you're able to go up and then go up again. Maybe a five set of five, maybe a five rep max, maybe a three rep max. The simplest and most gratifying measure of performance increase is the PR, forever, forever. It's the best thing we have, the best metric we have that tells us that we're making progress. Are you consistently making PRs? Three sets of five PRs, five sets of five PRs, five rep max, three rep max, one rep max, five singles across. That's why you have the notebook and you keep your meticulous records in your notebook, which I assume they all do, right? You keep those records so that you know, okay, the last time I did five sets of five, which might have been two weeks ago, it might have been three weeks ago, but the last time I did five sets of five, I did this much weight, and this time I was able to go up. Or I was able to do 365 for four sets of five, and this time I did 365 for five sets of five. That's quantifiable progress, right? So those metrics are really important. Now, there's a secondary group of quantifiable metrics we can use as well that are not as important as PRs. They're not as good as PRs, but they're still valuable. I don't want to throw them out. Those would be things like actual weight on the bar. Did the actual weight on the bar go up? Actual volume. Did the actual volume go up? Tonnage. Do you know what tonnage is? Tonnage is a calculation. It's real simple. Anybody know? What's tonnage? Weight times reps times sets. We just calculate the work stuff, right? Not the warm-ups. The warm-ups are just warm-ups. So if I did 300 pounds for three sets of five, I'd take 300 times three times five equals this number. That's tonnage. Now, tonnage is not a be-all, end-all, but it's a very important metric. Why is it not a be-all, end-all? Because 10 sets of 10 in German volume training is a giant tonnage amount that doesn't get you stronger. Intensity can actually mean two things. When I say intensity, I'm talking about how heavy but I can literally could mean magnitude, like literally how much weight is on the bar, literally, or I could mean relative intensity, which means what percentage of your one rep max is it? So you deadlifted 365. So if you're gonna deadlift 300 pounds, you take 300 divided by 365, you get a percentage number, you say, okay, I'm working at whatever that is, 
Well, if the next time you work 89% or 90%, that's a quantitative metric that says that you're making progress. Not to be all end all, PRs are better, but it works. Calculated one rep max, not to be all end all. Is it quantitative? Yes. You know how to calculate one rep max? You can look it up on Google. It's all the same, right? It's weight times 1.033 times reps. Is that right? I did that right? Yeah, I think that's right. Anyway, look it up. Google, calculated one rep max. Now, if you do 265 on squats for three sets of five, and you go into Google and you type in your calculated one rep max, and it says that your calculated one rep max is 315. Is your one rep max 315? No, your calculated max is 315. It's not the same thing. Somebody asks you how much do your squat, you don't get to say 315. You get to say 265 for three sets of five or whatever you actually squat. But it is a place that we can derive data. There is the primary quantitative metric we use, which is the PR, and there's the secondary quantitative metrics we use. I've had some other ones. Bar speed, which you guys can't really measure, but lots of athletic teams actually have a little thing that they, it's like a little, um, piece of Velcro ring that they put on the barbell and it's attached to what looks like a fishing line, like a fishing wire and a little tiny computer, a little box on the floor. And when they actually move the bar and they squat or they deadlift, it measures meters per second. You can put into the box, here's how much weight is on the bar. So it's 365 pounds on the bar. It moved this fast. It calculates force, right? Those things are thousand bucks. So you probably don't have them, but it's still a quantitative metric. So let's mention it. And a lot of times when I give this talk, to strength coaches who are at Division I universities, they have an unlimited budget. They're like, that's called a Tendo unit, that thing I just told you about. You know, 1000 bucks, 2000 bucks. Oh, yeah, we got 40 of them. Now, qualitative metric. Qualitative metrics. This is huge. Qualitative metrics are subjective. It's based on perception of the way you feel, and it's often self-reported. It basically says, how hard was it? How hard was it? How did this make you feel? So if I said, hey, if you did a deadlift set of 365 for a set of three, you did it for three reps. And I said, how many reps could you have done it for? You said, I don't know, probably five. That's qualitative. How do you know? How do you know you could have done it for five? You don't. You're just guessing. Now, that doesn't mean it's worthless. The longer you train, the longer you train, the more tight you'll get on some of that qualitative metric, but we cannot hold qualitative metrics on the same level as quantitative metrics. And then here's the deal. When we use qualitative metrics as a communication tool, as a descriptor for something, which is really just saying this, this might be a better way of saying it. Like, hey, how hard was it? It was really, really hard. Or it was hard. Or I don't know, it was moderate or it was easy. Those are all qualitative. Now, the longer you train, the more tight you'll get with that with description. Here's the problem. Many, many, many coaches program using qualitative metrics. They say, what you're gonna do is you're gonna work up to a set of five in the squats with a weight you could have done for eight. That's it, go. And you're like, I don't know what I can do for eight. I'm just gonna guess. I'm going to do it for five, right? Can you see how there's like way too much fuzz there? Why that could be a, a problem? But if it's a description, if it's just like, okay, you did it, you completed the work sets, I was there watching you in person or for us on online coaching, I videoed myself with my cell phone so I could see your bar speed and see how hard it looked like to me. And you say, yeah, it was this hard. I had two reps left in the tank. I had three reps left in the tank. It was as hard. I couldn't have performed another rep. It's fine for a communication tool back and forth. But it's not the same thing as a PR. You don't get to say, oh, I squatted 365. And last time I squatted 365, I had two reps in the tank. And this time I had three reps in the tank. So I'm more strong. No, it's too much perception. Bad data. Doesn't work. Right? So what we're going to do is that since we're going to increase force, since force production is what we want to do, since that's what strength is, strength is force production. We're going to make minimum effective dose changes, one change at a time, one change at a time, so we get good data. LP stops working, add a set to Monday. See if it keeps working. If it doesn't, that variable didn't work. If it does, you're fine. 
till it stops working. Take a set away from Friday. Go up. Do it again. Make Wednesday a light day. You're having a hard time recovering. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Go Monday, three sets of five. Wednesday, three sets of five at 80% of what you did Monday. And Friday, five pounds more than you did on Monday. So now you're going heavy twice a week instead of three times a week. But you added that recovery in. I need a little more recovery. I still needed a little bit of work because there's no work between Monday and Friday might make me detrain. I might actually get worse at squats. I still need some stress. I just don't want enough stress to like bonk me that I can't recover from. Make one change. What most people do is they finish one program, like novice linear progression, where all that happens is you go up and wait a little bit, and then they change to a totally different program, and they change the volume, the frequency, the intensity, like how heavy it is, the exercise selection. They bring in a bunch of new exercises. And then here's the problem. Even if that new program works, what worked? What variable was the thing that made it work? You don't know, because you just changed five variables. Don't change five variables. Like, while all of this is theory, right, the scientific method says, okay, I'm going to use logic and reason and my experience to derive, to come up with a hypothesis, and then I'm going to start testing that hypothesis. And when I test it, I'm going to have a control, and I'm going to change a variable, and I'm going to see how it works. If you change five variables, how do you know what variable worked? So if it didn't work, you don't know what didn't work. And if it did work, you don't know what did work. Change one thing at a time, and then keep making progress. There's no reason to train like a world's strongest man competitor. No reason to like read a magazine or like get online and like, I'm going to see what the guy who's world's strongest man is doing and do what he's doing when you just finish novice linear progression. That's an easy one for you guys to understand, right? Like nobody's in the world's strongest man. Why would you train that way? That guy's an advanced, advanced, advanced athlete. But what people will do is they'll go, well, here's a program for kind of intermediates or 531, which is a famous program that actually a buddy of ours wrote. And it's actually a perfectly good program, but it's a perfectly good program only at the right time. I have to work my way into it one step at a time by changing one variable at a time. Okay, last thing. When I get to someone who's at the end of novice linear progression where a lot of you are about to get into that spot, I choose to keep driving intensity up. I keep making the weight on the bar go up, which means because I can't do it three sets of five, I have to start making the volume go down. There's a relationship that's inverse like this. Volume has to start coming down in order for intensity to keep going up. If you're doing 270 for three sets of five and you get into the weight room and you do 275 and you can't hit it for three sets of five, especially if you try it again, get good sleep, get good food, miss it again, what you might do is go to 275 for three sets of three, which is less volume but more intensity. And then I might go to 280 for three sets of three, and then 285 for three sets of three, and then 290 for three sets of three, and then I can't hit it for three sets of three anymore. And then I might go to two sets of three, or I might go to 290 for one set of three, and 275 for two sets of three, and do a couple back off sets. Just change one thing. There's lots of things you could change, just change one. Now here's the question. If I use those quantifiable secondary metrics, if I calculate tonnage, if I calculate one rep max, if I calculate total work, and I go from three sets of five at 275 to three sets of three at 280, all of those calculations will show me is doing less. You with me? 280 times three times three is a lower number than 275 times three times five. Why would I keep making the intensity go up and the volume go down? What are we trying to do ultimately here? Just trying to get strong. And strength is force production. And so a 290-pound squat requires more force production than a 275-pound squat, even if it takes less volume to get there. That won't work that long. I'm only going to reduce the volume and increase the intensity for maybe four weeks with my clients. That's a practical sort of thing that I do. And here's another thing that occurs. I actually think voluntary hardship occurs. There is a refining power in this. 
you guys realize that like, I know nothing about any of your backgrounds, right? I have no idea. Some of you guys come from like broken homes or probably terrible backgrounds. Some of you get bougie or were born with a silver spoon up your hind end, right? Or whatever, right? So I don't know. Here's what I know. You don't get to choose the cards you're dealt when you're born. But there's an entire university out here who will not go in that weight room and put a heavy barbell on their back and squat. And for those of you guys who have already seen this, when you do that, it starts to refine you, not just physically, but refines you mentally, emotionally. It gives you a self-confidence you didn't know you had. Not an arrogance, not a douchebagginess. We're not doing this to be bodybuilders, right? We're not doing this to take pictures of our butts and post it on Instagram. That's not the deal, right? We're doing this. Do you do that? No. <laughs> so, I do that for We're doing this to get strong. And when we get strong, we choose voluntary hardship. We choose hardship. We choose to do something voluntarily that's hard. And that refines us. And by the way, strength is not the only thing that will do that. There are other things that do that. But there are lots of people who their whole life will go, they will never do anything hard and will never be refined by it. And that's a problem. That's why I get them heavy. That's why I make them go heavy because it will refine them in the process. And then I'll start letting them go a little bit lighter and we'll start doing more volume. Okay, let's wrap this up. These are the steps that I make, the actual practical, like, okay, I've been waiting for this whole, like, what do you actually do? This is not the only way to skin the cat. This is just what I do. So I start with novice LP, just like you guys have been doing, making five pound jumps every workout. When I can't make five pound jumps every workout, I make two and a half pound jumps every workout. I don't know that I would make less than two and a half pound jumps every workout with college kids. <laughs> some of you girls are probably, there's probably some girls in here that are relatively weak and small framed and stuff. And you have to make smaller jumps than two and a half pounds. There's nothing wrong with that, right? With a 60 year old lady, I got to make one pound jumps. I have an 82 year old lady. She's freaking awesome, right? She came to me. I started deadlifting with her. I had to go to her house. I made her deadlift a little bitty kettlebell. She's a pipe organ player at her Methodist church. And I stacked up Methodist hymnals up until they were like at her knees. And then I put a little kettlebell and she picked up a little tiny kettlebell. She's 82. She has double hip replacement, knee replacement. She has an inch cut off of her Achilles, right? She's a widow. Her husband died like seven years ago. She has a real nice house. And all of her kids live in the Pacific Northwest. She has nobody. She couldn't get off the toilet. She really struggled to get off the toilet. She couldn't get in and out of her car. Her brain was fine. She was like, fine. Tells great stories. Super, super sharp, right? Now, she did lifts 145 for sets of five. She's 82. It's changed her life, guys. This stuff matters. You know it matters. You saw what it's been doing to the kids that you're working with. They're not all kids. Some of them are grownups, right? You got a group of handicapped people who have been given better life skills and confidence and are able to communicate in a way that they weren't able to do because of this thing. It's not because of strength. I mean, it is, but it's because of voluntary hardship because they did something hard that refined them. That's why we do this stuff, right? So add weight for as long as I can. When I can't add weight anymore, I can't go up like microloading two and a half pounds. I might go to a Wednesday light day to give myself a little more recovery. Then I might move from the volume down and make the weight keep going up from three sets of five to three sets of three for a few weeks to a three rep max. So maybe like five singles across. Then I start bringing intensity down and volume back up until I get up to like four sets of five, five sets of five on Monday and one set of five on Friday. I do that for a while. And then when that doesn't work anymore, I get to what Marie is on right now, which is what's called a four day split. So now she doesn't train three days a week. She trains four days a week, but she squats and deadlifts twice on like Monday, Thursday. And she does bench press and press and upper body accessories like chin ups and stuff like that on like Tuesday and Friday or Tuesday and Saturday, four days. And I drive stress up that way. And then eventually I'll bring in some supplemental lifts to start attacking some of her weaknesses and we'll go from there. But all one thing at a time. And what most people do is they'll go from number one to number 12 overnight. There's no reason to do that. It doesn't give you good data. This is long-term <laughs> stuff. Long-term. I want this thing to last for 10 years. So we got to be smart about this thing, right? Different for everybody. That's why it has to be minimum effective dose change. It's why you can't take a template program that worked for one person and say it's going to work for the other person. Here's what we know. You know what works for everybody? Linear progression. Works for everybody. 
everybody. Some people it works better for than others. Better responders, better athletes are obviously going to do better at it than someone who is much less athletic. Doesn't matter. Works for everybody. When it stops working, make one change and keep progressing. When that stops working, make one change and keep progressing. And that works for everybody forever. Now, what change you make in what order might change based on your demographic. I might keep you at fives longer than I keep the girls at fives, but I'm still just going to make one change. And then I get good data. And the more data we have, the more we actually learn about this thing. By the way, there isn't any data. All the data on this stuff, have you guys studied this at all? All the data that you guys got on this stuff, I mean, you're collecting data. All right, so let me give the caveat. All the data in the published literature that's not being put out essentially by Nick Reculia <laughs> is bull, right? Like, they're doing data on strength and hypertrophy with a one-legged leg extension. We just did the Morton et al. article right. this week. Yeah, right. It, it, exactly. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Got to be hard. Like, duh, right? You read it, and you're like, it's, I just read an article that said scientists are going back. There's a big group of scientists. I need to find that article to tell you, too. That they've gone back and looked at studies over the past <laughs> just 10 years. Not like the past 60. And in the past 10 years, when they go back and reproduce the studies... 60% are wrong. <laughs> data matters. Like, that's what your entire background's on. But it's got to be good data. You don't get to take bad data, get your confirmation bias, and say, this is what works. Right? That's bad data. Okay. Um, thank you. Kirksey. <laughs> thank you, guys.